Good morning. Happy Sabbath. A wonderfully hot Happy Sabbath to you. And thank God for air conditioning. It's uh, not a lot of people here, but it's nice and cozy. And I want to welcome all the visitors and all the core members that are here today. Um, do you know what I dread the most about having to preach? It's not the fact that all the eyeballs are staring at me and the spotlights are beaming down on me, making me sweat. It's not the fact that my blood pressure is 190 over 100, pulse rate about 120. It's not the countless hours spent in front of a laptop researching this, reading that, ignoring your wife and kids all week long. <laughs> what I dread most about having to preach is Satan works extra hard bringing stress and distractions into my life leading up to the Sabbath day. And as some of you can relate, we're all always busy, busy, busy uh, with school activities, kick activities after school with our kids, busy with work, just busy, busy, busy. And for some reason, the week always leading up to the preaching day is like all hell breaks loose. But you know what? God is good, right? And all the time, God is good. And the blessings that come from praying, researching, prepping, outweigh anything that Satan throws at me. And as you have heard, the speaker is the one that gets the most blessings. And I hope you will be blessed this morning, not because of anything I have to say, but that God, through the Holy Spirit, will speak to you personally, to each one of you. So with that said, um, please bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, uh, what a crazy week it's been. And within the chaos of life, you have you and your infinite mercy and wisdom have created a day, every seven days, so that we can come together and worship you that we can come together with like-minded believers uh, to encourage and strengthen each other. So I request now uh, to clear our minds and hearts from all distractions so that we can listen to that still, small voice. Not my unworthy voice, but personally translate each word that enters every year here. Uh, convict us, convert us, and change us into your image. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So life lessons from Jay. Life lessons from Jay. Do you guys want drama? TNT and HBO have nothing on this. K-drama can't even make this up. And this kid grew up in one messed up home, full of lies and deceit, and with each generation, it kept getting worse. Now keep in mind, this family was the ones, one family that God specifically chose to be the light of the world, to be an example, a showcase of God's love to the heathens, to the world and future generations to come. And it was through this family that the savior of the entire human race would come from, thousands of years later. Now this kid's father, for most of his life, was living a life on the run, so scared to death of his twin brother because he lied and tricked their father into giving him the birthright. This kid's father then got a taste of his own medicine and was tricked into marrying the older sister of the woman that he loved for, after working seven long years. And he still loved his now new wife's younger sister so much that he labored again for seven years to marry the true love of his life. And apparently in this family, there was a contest among the sisters, a game called Who Can Have the Most Kids? Kind of sounds like my sisters. Anyway, these two sisters grew intensely jealous of each other to the point that they gave their own personal servants to their husbands as wives so then they can claim their servants' kids as their own. You know, how messed up is that, right? This would probably be the most highly rated TV show in this day and age called Desperate Housewives of Canaan, except they were all married to one guy. And this guy had four wives now, and they were producing kids left and right. But it gets worse. These brothers had one sister who wandered into foreign territory to hang out with some other women of the land, and unfortunately, while she was there, she was raped, humiliated, and defiled by the prince of the land. So older brothers, number two and three, vowed revenge, and through deception again, which seems strong in this family genes, they told the king of the land, if you want to intermarry with our family, you must first be circumcised. So they convinced and tricked all the men, all the male of the land to circumcise, circumcise themselves. And while they were healing and couldn't move, these two brothers went in and killed all the males in the city. 
to avenge what happened to their sister. It doesn't stop there. Oldest brother number one slept with wife number three. Another brother, number four, although accidentally, through deception again, got his own daughter-in-law pregnant. Through lies, deceit, murder, jealousy, trickery, polygamy, incest, this was the history of Jacob's family. This is how the nation of Israel came to be. The future 12 sons of Israel, the future 12 tribes of Israel, this family was a mess and probably one of the most dysfunctional families in the Bible. So this is the setting, right? This is the family, this is the environment that Joseph, son number 11, grew up in. And as I said, this is the most dysfunctional family, the, type, the setting that he was raised in. And can you believe this was only 12 generations after Noah, after the flood? This was the supposed godly lineage through Noah, through his son Shem, that God was trying to preserve because sin got so bad. Did you know, uh, do you know what's interesting and fascinating? I never realized or thought about this till now, but did you know that Shem, Noah's son, one of the eight that survived the flood, actually lived longer than Abraham, who came nine generations later? He died 35 years after Abraham died. So Noah, Shem, and Abraham actually lived on earth at the same time for a total of 39 years. And it's very possible that Noah and Shem were the ones that taught little Abraham all the things of the antediluvian world, the stories of creation, of Adam and Eve, all the things that we read in Genesis up to the point where Abraham was called to leave his home. And uh, you could say that Shem was Abraham's spiritual guide. In fact, although it's not specifically documented in the Bible, but there are other books, his, historical books in the Hebrews that actually say that Adam sought counsel from Shem and that he actually helped educate Isaac and Jacob. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but I think it's very plausible because they lived together at the same time. And Shem was still alive when Jacob turned 50, actually. So that's an interesting side tangent. But the point is that from the time of the flood, sin was almost wiped out. Only eight made it through, but sin was alive, and it kept getting worse, kept getting worse with each generation. As you know, sin always gets worse, and its influences get passed down to the next generation. And we as parents, we as future parents, we have a huge responsibility to train, train the minds and character of our children. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, I always tell my kids, do as I say, not as I do. But you know, that's a fallacy, right? Kids will always do what I do, right? Or what they see. Monkey see, monkey do, right? I personally need to follow the principles of 1 Timothy 4 if I want my kids to be grounded in God. I first need to be a good servant of God, being trained in the words of faith, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, I first need to train myself for godliness and immerse myself in the things of good speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. And verse 15 and 16 says, if I practice these things and persist in them, not only will I save myself, but I will save those around me, my family, my kids, my friends. I must first reflect Christ in all that I do if I want my kids to do the same. I can sit here and tell them a thousand times till I'm blue in the face, but if I don't practice what I preach, nor have love, 1 Corinthians 13 says, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And I hope to pass some godly lessons from Jake down to my kids and to those who I associate with. So going back to the family of Jacob, not this Jacob, but the Jacob of the Bible. And as I briefly summarized a few minutes ago, Jacob and Jacob again had a dysfunctional family. And his sins had an influence of evil to the sons who received these seeds, which later sprouted up and bore the fruits of character flaws. The results of polygamy, drama, and jealousy from the four mothers took its toll on the family, and Jacob's life was darkened with anxiety and grief. But there was one son, however, who had a different character, the silver lining in this messed up family. Even though things may have seemed to be out of control, from our perspective, God was in control. And even though Satan and his minions were trying to wreak havoc into God's plan, 
God uses those things and flips it upside down to fulfill his will. So here was Joseph, son number 11. He was the oldest son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And Patriarchs and Prophets says, Joseph had a rare personal beauty that reflected the inward beauty of mind and heart. He was pure, active, and joyous, and moral earnestness and firmness. He always listened to his father and loved to obey God. So after Rachel died, Jacob clung onto Joseph even more, and the Bible says that he loved Joseph more than all his children. The problem is, the problem was that Jacob publicly showed his preference for Joseph, which stirred up jealousy among the other brothers. And then add to this, Joseph had a pure character, and when his brothers were up to no good, he couldn't endure seeing them sinning against God. So he would tell his father what they were doing with the hopes that his father's authority would lead them to change. His intentions were good, but it only fueled hatred and resentment towards him. Now, some of you can relate, and I've been on the fence both sides. Uh, before my quote-unquote conversion, I was living a kind of a worldly life, and those people who were more conservative uh, really turned me off. And I hate to put this on a scale, but I just made up this scale for illustrative purposes, so take it with a huge bag of salt. So let's say number one is like the most liberal lifestyle you can have with absolutely no regard for spiritual things. And 10 is like the stereotypical ultimate country dwelling, ultra vegan, homeschooling, large garden in the backyard, absolutely no media of any kind in the house, still styling clothes from the 1980s. You know, you get this stereotypical picture, right? So I was, be, I was born and raised in SoCal, and I'd say I'd be maybe about number four. We never missed church, we kept the Sabbath, got a Christian education, I wouldn't dare eat any of the unclean meats of Leviticus, but the other meats, get out of my way. I was allowed to watch TV, cartoons, movies, played video games all the time. And then when I was about 10 years old, we moved from the huge city life of LA to a country piece of property about an hour from here. And we went, I went from like a four to a, like a seven immediately. So imagine, talk about culture shock. I was this rebellious little uh, jashik, um, especially to my homeschool teacher, who had the best intentions to teach me good Southern manners and the true ways of Bible and Ellen White. And God bless her. And I made her cry so many times. I still feel guilty when I see her and her mother to this day. <laughs> so this little LA kid was a major pain, but I was also influencing the other kids, mostly cousins that moved here with me. So years later, there were other extended families that moved uh, to the rural areas, and they actually ended up going up to scale to about a nine or a 10. And every time I would visit with them and hang out with them and with their church group, oh man, my, my conscience was on overload and this like rebellious spirit was just trying to burst out of me. And at that time, although I never actually personally read Ellen White's writings, I despised her and her writings. And I would argue with some of these kids that would quote her, just based on my twisted principle. Here's one life lesson from Jake you should not follow. Now, as a parent, and now halfway through my life, having actually read a lot of her writings, I was such a fool. I'm still a fool, but at least a little bit more enlightened fool. Now, the tables have switched, and it's funny, because when I meet some of my friends for a little bit, more on the liberal side of the scale, I find myself having to defend the Bible and her writings. And perhaps I make them feel like how I felt in my younger years. So this is exactly how Joseph's brothers felt. Every time they saw him, I can relate. Maybe some of you can relate. You just feel uncomfortable when that godly person of faith walks into the room. You feel like you're gonna be in trouble just by their presence. You can't really make eye contact with them because even though you didn't do anything wrong, you just feel guilty, right? And to add to that, Jacob makes a very unwise decision to make him a very expensive coat of many colors. And back in those days, a coat or a tunic was a symbol of status, only worn by people of distinction. And the brothers start to get suspicious that the birthright might skip them and be, everything will be given to Joseph. Add to that, Joseph has the audacity to tell the brothers that he had a dream where they would all be bowing down to him. This infuriates them even more. And then he tells about the second dream where the sun, moon, and stars bow down to him. Even Jacob, though he knew God was revealing the future to Joseph, harshly rebukes him, 
saying, will even I and your mother and your brothers bow down to you? So you could say that Joseph was starting to get maybe a little spoiled perhaps, happy-go-lucky Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, but they could not deny his purity. And it was his character that pricked, his con pricked their conscience. But it's one thing to have conviction to change. The problem is they wouldn't repent of their evil thoughts and ways. So what life lessons can we learn from Jay, Jacob? Jacob of the Bible. Be careful showing preference towards family members, friends, employees, co-workers, church members, because this can cause others to be tempted to jealousy, resentment, evil thoughts, you fill in the blank. So the story continues, and as you know, his brothers leave home with their flocks, and they're gone for months. And Jacob starts to worry because they're hanging out near the land where Simeon and Levi killed all the males of Shechem years before. So Jason, uh, Joseph puts on his coat. Just a side note, but just my thoughts, but you would think he would have enough common sense not to wear the coat, right? Especially if he knew his brothers, if he knew how his brothers felt about it. And he might as well like jump into a Ferrari, pull up next to their Civic hatchbacks, and honk their horns and rev his engine. So Joseph travels over 50 miles to find them, and he arrives in Shechem and is told by some wandering random person that they are now in Dothan. So he has to walk another 15 miles to find them. And even though he's tired, he wants to relieve the anxiety of his father and meet his brothers. And even though they treated him with unkindness, he still loved them. So the brothers see this bright coat off in the distance, walking towards them, and they are just filled with envy and rage. They would have killed him right there on the spot, but thanks to Reuben, he proposed that they just throw him into a pit and let him die there, secretly intending to rescue him later on. So Joseph expects, arrives expecting a nice family dinner, but instead sees a satanic spirit among his brothers as they rip off his coat, drag him, and push him into the dark pit. Now brother number four, Judah, proposes that they sell, them, sell him to the Midianite traders who are heading to Egypt instead of killing him, and they might as well make some money, right? And when Joseph figured out what was going on, Spirit of Prophecy says he had terror running down his spine, and he pleaded and screamed to each brother, because to become a slave was a fate worse than death. Some of the brothers felt compassion and guilty, but they kept silent because they were afraid of what the other brothers might say. Also, some have felt that they were already, they've already gone too far to turn back. You know, when we are convicted and our conscience is pricked, we need to stand up what's, when it's right, when it's fresh in our minds and repent. The worst thing we can do is linger and wait idly by. Because what, what's, what's going to happen is you will start to justify your actions, give reasons of excuse. Satan will tell you it's too late to come back, so you might as well go forward and commit that sin. Rewind back to when Jacob's daughter, Dina, was raped. Jacob didn't do anything when he first found out. And because he tarried, because of his inaction, later on, two of his sons ended up killing all the males of that city. When Lot was told to leave Sodom, the Bible says he lingered. And because he lingered, because of his hesitancy and delay, caused his wife to be turned into a pillar of salt. Petrus and Prophet says, had Lot quickly obeyed the angel's warnings, he would have been saved, or she would have been saved. When you are convicted, don't linger, don't delay. Not only will it affect your future, but it could affect the future of others around you. Obedience delayed is disobedience. There is no guarantee that you will be able to make that same decision 10 minutes from now. So, as a 17-year-old, how many of you are 17 right now? 16, 17, 18. Okay, a lot of teenagers, right? So imagine you are Joseph right now. Joseph is headed towards Egypt, and he replays the events of his rage-filled brothers and how they treated him and sold him to slavery. And in that instant, he went from a favorite son, future all set, financially stable, with a beautiful coat on his back, to a despised, helpless, half-naked slave with nothing on his back but torn clothes. Imagine how you would feel as a 17-year-old going through this right now. And Patriots and Pockets says, for a time, Joseph gave 
himself up to uncontrolled grief and terror. I mean, it's natural, right? Your life changes like that. But in Genesis 39, 2, it says, the Lord was with Joseph. This experience was a blessing to him. And what he was learning right now in these few hours would have taken years. All the faults from his father's indulgent favoritism toward him was causing him to become self-sufficient, self-righteous. And had he had continued down this path, he would have been unprepared to face and cope with the trials to come. And think of this from another perspective. Had not the traitors have been there, he probably would have been killed by his brothers. So God, in his mercy, at the right time, sent these traitors to save Joseph's life from his brother's wrath. And during the short amount of time, Joseph resolved to prove himself true to God under all circumstances and trials. Just like Daniel purposed in his heart as he was headed to Babylon, Joseph purposed in his heart that he would perform every duty to the best of his ability with integrity to glorify God. He would serve the Lord and perform every duty with fidelity. It was as if a light bulb went out in his head, and he went from uncontrolled grief, terror-stricken child, to a courageous, valiant, spirit-possessed man. What life lesson can we learn from Jay? If we, propose in our, if we purpose in our hearts, especially while going through a tough trial, the Lord will be with you. In all that you do, your work, your family, your school, everything that you do, no matter what the circumstance, do it to the best of your ability with integrity and glorify God, and God will be with you. So, the 17-year-old kid arrives in Egypt, ends up in the house of Potiphar, the captain of the king's guard, and for 10 years he serves his master faithfully, as he purposed in his heart he would do. From 17, year olds, from 17 years old to the rest of his life, he was exposed to all the temptations of idolatry, royalty, worship of false gods, surrounded by wealth in the most advanced, civilized uh, nation in the world. It was like going from the country farms of Appleton, Tennessee to the main strip of Las Vegas. Despite of being exposed to all of this, he preserved his relationship with God. Although the sinful sights and sounds were all around him, tempting him, he did not allow his mind to linger on those things. And he quietly did his thing to the best of his ability, but also made no effort to hide the fact that he worshiped the true God of heaven. And because of his faithfulness, Genesis 29, 2 and 3 says, the Lord was with Joseph and became a successful man in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So day to day, Potiphar noticed that he was being blessed because of Joseph, and eventually he was promoted to be in charge of everything that he dealt with. He trusted Joseph so much that the only thing Potiphar worried about was the food that was on his table. The character of Joseph won the heart of Potiphar so much that Potiphar actually regarded him as his son rather than a slave. Potiphar gives him a new coat, a coat that shows authority over all of Captain's household. Another life lesson from Jay. Joseph definitely credited his success to the, to the favor of God, but these things didn't just naturally come. It wasn't a direct miracle from God. Everything Joseph did took hard work lots of energy, with steadfast effort, diligence with integrity, and that's how Potiphar took notice and eventually promoted him. He didn't just wake up one day and say, I trust you, you're in charge of all my business affairs. You know, we live in a time and generation where people feel entitled, there's instant gratification, they feel like they should just get it, not because they earned it, but just because, whatever crazy reason. I deserve it without work, hard work. But I hate to break it to you, this is, this is, uh, this is not how God's uh, blessings work. Sure, there are times where miracles happen from time to time, but we still have to put in our time, our energy, our diligence, and a good work ethic is excellent character trait by itself. But add to that, God's going to bless those efforts if we stay true and faithful to him. Now, Satan works hard, especially in times of success, to tempt you. And Joseph's faith and integrity was constantly being tested by Potiphar's wife. Day after day, the Bible says day after day, she would constantly harass him to lie with her. And each day she would get bolder and bolder. She was relentless. When a woman wants something, there is no stopping her. I'm sure she offered him rewards, 
special favors, possible, even possible freedom. She probably said anything to get him to give in. But Joseph knew what was at stake. He knew his future depended upon that decision on that moment. Stay given or stay true to principle. Again, Patriarch and Prophet says, with inexpressible anxiety, angels looked upon that scene. What would he do? He tells her, and I'm sure many times, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So she comes up with a plan. One day she gets everybody out of the room, and it's only her and Joseph, and she grabs him and tries to force him. But he somehow wiggles his way out of his coat and runs out of the room. This poor guy cannot keep any of his coats. <laughs> and you know the story. She falsely accuses him. And, uh, and falsely accuses him of trying to lie with her when it was the other way around. And her husband hears of it, and the Bible says his anger was kindled. But you know what? I don't think his anger was kindled against Joseph. Because he knew Joseph would do no such thing. I'm sure he knew his wife. I'm sure that he knew that she was trying to cheat on him. And his anger was more kindled, I would think, at the situation because he knows he has to do something to save face. And he knows he's going to have to lose Joseph and then all the blessings that came with Joseph. If he truly believed his wife, Joseph would be dead right there. He would kill him. There's, he's a slave. There's no, uh, there's no trial. He has no rights. So just like that, Joseph goes from ruler of Potiphar's house to a prisoner. Life lessons from Jay. We should strive, we should, we should uh, live our lives as if God is standing right next to us. Well, he actually is, but make that mental picture in your brain. He sees and hears what we do, and everything is being recorded. Our thoughts, our words, and actions. Remember, whatever we do, we are doing right there in the presence of God. And also during the times of temptations and trials, as trivial as it may be, stay faithful and true because those traits will start to become ingrained in our character. And then when the greater trials and temptations come, God's going to provide a way of escape, and you will be able to resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And if you are faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the great things. So at the age of 27, Joseph is falsely accused and thrown into prison. And at first, he was beaten and treated very harshly by his jailers. But during those dark times in the dungeon, his true character was shining out. He remembers 10 years ago that he purposed in his heart to stay faithful and true to God. And all these years of time, energy, hard work, diligence was being repaid by being falsely accused. He lost everything again. But he didn't have a pity party. His faith didn't break down. There is a peace that comes with a clear, innocent conscience. What can you do, though? All he can do is leave it up to God. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So what does Joseph do? Instead of crying, whining, and complaining, he starts to lighten the sorrows of others in the dungeon. Even in prison, he has a work to do. He was still diligent, and no matter what the circumstance surrounded him, and Satan tried to discourage him by falsely accusing him, but God flips it and uses it to train him for a future purpose. And in the dark dungeons, he learns the lessons of sympathy, justice, mercy, and all the things to prepare him to make wise decisions with compassion. And as he ministers to the fellow inmates, the jailer takes note, and within a short time, this prisoner is in charge of all prisoners. Now, you guys know the story. The chief butler and chief baker ends up in prison. And maybe their service was terrible at a party, or maybe there was an assassination attempt on Pharaoh's life. But in any case, they're being investigated, so they're in prison. And they both have a dream. Long story short, the butler, as predicted, ends up being restored back to his position. And he's about to leave. Joseph pleads with him to bring his case before the king. He says, think about me. Show me kindness and tell Pharaoh that I was stolen, made a slave, falsely accused, and now in prison. Please remember me. Now, at this point, Joseph was in jail for one year. Now there's a glimmer of hope. Maybe there's a chance he can have a fair trial. Maybe he'll be pardoned by the king. 
So he waits a day. Any word? A few days. Any word? Maybe a week. Any word from the butler? Maybe next month I'll hear something. For two painful years, let that sink in, two years, 720 days, he was still trapped in that dungeon, the dark dungeon of hell. Any hope of becoming free dies out. Add to that all the trials he has already gone through. Imagine how tempted Joseph would be to complain. Complain, complain. What would complaining do anyway? It's not going to change the situation. All it would do is bring everyone else down around him. For two more years, Joseph faithfully did his duties, ministering to the other prisoners, perhaps teaching them all the things he has learned as a shepherd, or all the things he had learned while he was in charge of Potiphar's business affairs. You know, during his tenure as Potiphar's CEO, I'm sure he came in contact with many important people of the world, learning new languages, learning business transactions, military training, farming. But, you know, Joseph didn't know at the time, but all those things God was using to train him to become the future second in command of Egypt. And I'm sure that prison was one of the cleanest, the most organized prison in the world. Life lessons from Jay. You may be going through your own dungeon experience right now. The clouds of darkness are so thick, you can't see God's presence through it. But be patient, be diligent. Instead of having a pity party and saying, woe is me, woe is me, minister to others. Lighten the sorrows of others, and by doing so, your sorrow will be lightened. Instead of focusing on me, 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 instead of complaining and whining what situation you're in, use it as a learning experience Learn the lessons that it's providing, and don't give up on God. He is still there, despite the fact that you can't see him. Sometimes these trials are there to train you, to give you wisdom and experience to overcome bigger ones. Or perhaps those trials are there so you can have empathy for others who are going through the same thing. And every time Joseph faithfully did his part, what happened was it opened a way for his future prosperity and restored honor. Every caring word that we speak Every act is done to relieve the oppressed. Every gift to the needy, needy, all done with the right motive, will be blessed by God. So never give up. Don't be lazy, but work hard and be diligent in all circumstances. You have to fight on. If you like failed an exam or a class, fight on. Or you Asians, if you got an A minus, don't give up. Fight on. <laughs> if you don't get into grad school, fight on. Don't give up. If your marriage is, or your relationships are falling apart, don't give up. Fight on in the Lord. If you're dying under a mountain of debt, don't give up. Fight on. You get the point, right? Our scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the, day, uh, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We need to be steadfast and patient during the trials life throws at us. But our labor in the Lord will not be vain. And when we get to heaven, when we reflect on our life here on earth, and we see the bigger picture of how God was working behind the scenes, orchestrating the best possible way to save us for all eternity, those painful trials that we went through will be insignificant as we reflect back. And what, what's going to happen is we're going to declare to God, we would have lived our lives no other way than the life we have lived. It was all worth it. I would have it no other way. So don't give up. Be steadfast and fight on. Now, as you know, Joseph has, uh, I'm just, Pharaoh has a dream. And it disturbs him so much that he calls the emergency meeting of all the musicians and wise men. Nobody can satisfactorily give him an interpretation. And as the days progress, the king's stress increases and becomes agitated. And the chief butler hears about the dilemma and then instantly remembers about Joseph. It just hits him. And with guilt and remorse for his ingratitude, he tells the king how Joseph helped him when he was in prison and how he interpreted dreams on how everything became true. Now, the king must have been so desperate to know the meaning of this dream because it was very humiliating for him to reject his wise men, his magicians, and seek advice from a Hebrew, not only a foreigner, but a foreign slave that was thrown into prison. So Joseph gets up, gets cleaned up, and presents himself before the king. And Pharaoh asks Joseph, I heard you can interpret dreams. Now Joseph tells him, 
that it is not me that can interpret, but God will give you the answer to your dreams. Joseph gives God the credit. Joseph tells the king the interpretation doesn't, Joseph tells the king the interpretation, but he doesn't stop there. He gives him advice. There's a plan of action, a solution of how to prepare for the famine during the years of plenty. All those years of diligently working as a slave, all the experiences he had in prison just comes out. And those recommendations sound so reasonable. So here's a lesson that we can learn. You know, we as Adventists know the Bible and the prophecies inside out, right? We're so good at telling people what's going to happen. But then we say, okay, good luck. God bless you. See you. Wouldn't want to be a, you know, that type of attitude, right? Like Joseph, we not only need to tell them the problems, but we can need to also come up with the solution of those problems. We need to proclaim the gospel, but also be problem solvers. So the king has a new dilemma, right? Who's going to oversee all the recommendations when the time of crisis comes? The chief butler, guilty, again guilty for not remembering Joseph's kindness, praises and gives him a good report of how Joseph excelled in wisdom and while he managed the prison. And the king does a thorough background check and finds out the history of Joseph's life. All the stories and rumors check out, and there's nothing that he can find on Joseph that would threaten his kingdom. The king was convinced that Joseph would be the best option, and he saw that there was a divine power, a different power compared to his gods. He saw the spirit of the true God, that he saw that the true spirit of God was with Joseph. So for a third time, Joseph gets another tunic, this time a royal one, signifying that he is second in command, and along with that, Pharaoh personally gives him his own ring, gold chain around his neck, and put him on a chariot. Joseph is now the ruler of all of Egypt. But with that kind of status, at that level, there's always dangers of temptation associated with high honor and positions of wealth. But Joseph remained consistent. His character had been tested tried over and over and over and over again. And through the ups and downs, he maintained his integrity to God. And now he was ready to fulfill the duties of his new position. And because of Joseph, many great men of Egypt was able to learn about God, the true God of heaven. So character starts with the little things in life. Everything, no matter big or small, everything has an influence on us. Life throws challenges along the way to test our faithfulness, and as we pass through those little things, we're able to face bigger ones. But it all starts with communication with God. And we need to strengthen our mind with his word, learning from the, and also learning from the book of nature. And it is faithful in these little things, attention to duty, no matter how lowly the task, that develops our character. A noble character is a work of a lifetime, and God will give us opportunities to de develop them. And success determines whether we will use it for God's purpose or God's glory or for our own. And you know, it all started when Joseph purposed in his heart that he would remain true to God, no matter what the circumstances were. If Joseph didn't practice these things, he would not have had complete trust of Potiphar. If his character wasn't impeccable, he would have died when he was falsely accused. Even in prison, he rose to the occasion. He never gave up. He fought on and became the person in charge of the prison. If he hadn't been in charge of the prison, he would have never had the opportunity to meet the butler and, uh, and interpret his dreams, which means he would have never had the chance to meet Pharaoh and interpret his dreams, which means he would have never been second in command in the most powerful nation of the world. So because of his fidelity, because of his, what he purposed in his heart, the nation of Israel started and was pervert, uh, preserved. We had just covered just a snippet. Each lesson could be a sermon on its own. We had just covered a little snippet of the various J's, life lessons from J. But there was just one more J I want to add to the mix. And most of you know already, Joseph was a type of Jesus. There are so many parallels that the two have in common. Joseph was the only, begotten, only beloved son of his father in Canaan, the Promised Land. Jesus was the only beloved son of his father in heaven, the future promised land. Joseph was sent by his father to find his wayward brothers. Jesus was find, sent to find and save his wayward people. Joseph was hated by his brothers because of his life and character, and it pricked their conscience. Jesus was hated by his own people because his pure life exposed their wickedness, wicked hearts. 
When Joseph arrived, his brothers plotted to kill him. When Jesus arrived, his people plotted to kill him. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver by his own brothers. Jesus was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver by his own disciple. Joseph was constantly tempted, especially by Potiphar's wife, day after day. And I imagine she promised him the world if he would just do that one thing. After the baptism, Jesus was constantly tempted by Satan, who promised him the whole world if he would do that one thing. Jesus was tempted in all points, like us, but was without sin. Joseph refused to dishonor God, and he was sentenced to prison under false accusations. Jesus was also tried and sentenced under false accusations. During trial, in, trials and injustices, Joseph patiently endured and kept his faith, faith and integrity strong with God. During trials and injustices, Jesus patiently endured and kept his faith and integrity strong with God. Joseph, through his bondage in Egypt, became the savior to his people. Jesus, through his bondage on earth, became a savior to his people. Jesus tried, uh, I'm sorry, Satan tried to stop the prophecies of Joseph's dreams becoming true by subjecting him to all kinds of things that he went through, but God used those specific trials to actually fulfill the prophecies of his dream. The same with Jesus' life. Satan tried to, in every way, prevent the prophecies of Jesus to come true, but in, in the end, it actually ended up fulfilling him. Joseph's brothers thought they would destroy him by sending him to Egypt, but it was through the Egyptians at the end that he was able to save his brothers. Jesus' enemies turned him over to the Romans, but it was through the Romans that he was crucified and it was able to save mankind. Now, when Joseph's brothers came later and bowed before him at the feet of the throne, Joseph forgave them. When we bow before the throne of grace, we will be forgiven. Joseph was thought for dead by his father, but was reunited, reunited with a joyous celebration. Jesus died, but was reunited with his father, and all of heaven broke out with a joyous celebration. Joseph and his family were able to be reunited and live together. On a side note, Jacob enjoyed his son, Joseph, for 17 years before he was taken away, right? Did you know that after they reunited, Jacob and his son lived 17 years before Jacob died? Interesting. Anyways, Jesus and his family will be united one day and will live together. I want to end with this uh, story here. There was a captain, a son of a captain of the British Royal Marines, and coincidentally, his name was Joseph. Another life lesson from Jay. So Joseph Scriven, Scriven was born in Ireland 1819. After receiving his university degree from Trinity College in London, he quickly established himself as a teacher, fell in love, and made plans to settle in his hometown. Then tragedy struck. The day before his scheduled wedding, his fiancée drowned. Overcome with grief, Scriven left Ireland and started a new life in Canada. He established a home in Rice Lake, where he met and fell in love with Eliza Rice. Just weeks before she was to become Joseph's bride, she suddenly grew sick, and in a matter of weeks, Eliza died. A shattered Joseph turned to the only thing that anchored him during his life, his faith. And through prayer, Bible study, he found not only solace, but a mission. This 25-year-old Joseph took a vow of poverty, sold all his earthly possessions, and vowed to give his life to the physically handicapped and financially destitute. Ten years later, Joseph received word that his mother had become very ill. The man who had taken a vow of poverty did not have the funds to go home to help take care of her. Heartsick and feeling the need to reach out to her, he wrote the story of his life in three short verses. And here are the lessons from Jay, compressed into a poem. He wrote, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Should we not be discouraged? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who, will, who all our sorrows share? 
Jesus knows our very every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Will thou wilt find a solace there. So as we sing our final hymn, obviously it's going to be this, these words. Uh, I want you to really think about these words and apply them into your lives.